Hi, it's uh, Dr. Miskoff, Jeff Miskoff. It's March 29th, 2020, about 10.30 p.m., and I'll be vlogging from my kitchen again here in Toms River, New Jersey. And tonight I wanted to discuss some of the pathophysiology or pathogenesis, I should say, of uh, the COVID-19 virus. And I, I did promise that I would start off each vlog uh, from now on, or yesterday's uh, vlog, uh, with a fact about, about the virus. And um, I just wanted to quickly review that We've gone through an evolution of viruses. Uh, SARS was in 2002. Um, uh, that was the COVID-S. And then MERS came uh, just about 10 years later. Um, so MERS, and that was, uh, again, about 12, 2012. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, which would be uh, 2019, of course, uh, hence the 19. Um, but the fact about all three of those is that uh, they were believed to come from uh, the bat as the uh, immediate source, the uh, initial source. And curiously, I was looking at the, uh, looking this up, and uh, SARS uh, went from the bat uh, to presumably the civet animal, and the MERS, uh, MERS went from the bat to the camel, and then uh, COVID-19 uh, from the bat uh, to the pangolin. Um, civets and pangolins was uh, not animals that I'm, I'm very familiar with, but uh, certainly they, they seem to be involved. Uh, also, interestingly, the nucleotide or RNA sequence uh, seems to be about 79% the same between the current uh, uh, COVID-19 and the 2002 SARS, and the uh, RNA or nucleotide uh, seems to be about 55-56% about about the same as the 2012 mares. So uh, coming from the bat and a similar RNA, those are fun facts for the night with COVID-19, although there's nothing fun about uh, COVID-19. Um, I did uh, post on one of my sites uh, an a article on melatonin. I have to give credit to uh, the publication by Dr. Zhang. I'm going to hold this up. Uh, this was printed from, uh, from that publication, and I'll try and figure out a way to get that um, uh, on the YouTube, I know it's on my Facebook uh, page, so you can kind of see that and the pathophysiology, um, uh, pathogenesis behind uh, this this virus. Um, so this was uh, March 23rd. That was available online, 2020. Dr. Zhang et al. And they're from uh, he's from Peking, China. Uh, melatonin. Let's not forget is N-acetyl-5-methoxytryptamine. Tryptamine a derivative. Um, we've all uh, heard of tryptophan. Um, so I wanted to put that up because it, you know, we, we did uh, mention before how the ACE2 receptor is how the, uh, the virus does in fact enter um, the lungs, at least it's believed that, and uh, also uh, ACE2 receptors on the kidneys as well, and cardiac muscle and probably uh, muscle. Um, and you can see that there's a cycle here that uh, is happening. And unfortunately, some of these patients will succumb to death. Uh, many of them will recover as well, as we're hearing all over the press. Um, and unfortunately, like I said, there's a predicted uh, 100 to 200,000 deaths if, if everything uh, is mitigated and, and I guess goes well, um, as they said. Uh, multiple organs can be involved. Sepsis can be involved. Uh, you can be obviously agitated if you're on a mechanical ventilator. We're hearing stories around the country of uh, ICUs concerned that they may run out of sedation. We know that there's a lot of prone ventilation going on where patients are being flipped on their bellies. Um, even prior to intubation, uh, my colleagues are reporting uh, with some success, but uh, uh, pain uh, and, of course, vessel permeability, uh, Part of the pathogenesis of acute respiratory distress syndrome and capillary leak, hyaline membrane formations, and sedation use, of course, goes up in sleep disorders. We'll have a whole session on insomnia one of these days. Uh, the cytokine storm that everybody's concerned about, um, you can see over here the uh, interleukins and interferon. Um, IL-6 is the uh, topic of interest. Uh, last night I mentioned uh, clinical trials that, were, that are undergoing. Um, so uh, we did talk about that a little bit last night um, with uh, cerilumab as an IL-6 inhibitor, which uh, actually is in clinical trial now, Kevzara, and um, uh, tozolizumab, uh, Actemra is also uh, in clinical trials, and, and uh, docs, and including us, have utilized that uh, on patients, and at least with some anecdotal success. Um, 
So uh, IL-6 is certainly one of the targets. Uh, I did mention yesterday uh, the VEGF uh, upregulation that occurs in, in uh, ARDS and in these processes and a clinical trial that is undergoing now against, uh, against that uh, protein. And, um, and there's others in there as well, IL-2, IL-8. Um, IL-10 uh, actually uh, may have some positive benefit. Not all of these are uh, necessarily bad. Um, but it's uh, not been studied in any significant detail. We don't know if the IL-10 going, uh, going up um, uh, is uh, an effect of potentially medications that have been giving, given uh, for COVID-19 uh, also having that effect. So this is the vicious cycle, and the hope here is that uh, melatonin um, uh, can kind of block uh, uh, either receptors or uh, some sort of proteins either upregulating upreg or downregulating. Uh, uh, these uh, these proteins that are involved in the inflammation. Um, I think it's uh, you know important to understand um, that melatonin has several uh, potential actions, whether it be anti-inflammation, as I as I just mentioned, or uh, an antioxidant effect is also thought to be part of it, and um, some sort of immune modulating or immune uh, boosting uh, capacity. It gets a little bit more complex from there. The anti-inflammatory effect is supposed to occur through a um, protein called uh, sirtuin uh, one or CERT1, I should say. Um, uh, uh, there's uh, another one called 1-HMGB1, uh, and again, inhibiting this and down-regulating these inflammatory proteins um, that uh, also uh, involve down-regulating down macrophages or macrophages uh, that normally move into the inflammation area. Um, there's also a, a very well-known uh, nuclear factor, kappa beta. We call it NFKB. It's uh, been involved in other pro-inflammatory and pro-oxidative uh, states, and it's thought that melatonin suppresses that, down-regulates it in T cells, and that that NF cap, kappa beta, again, which uh, most uh, scientists or, or clinicians have heard of, at least of, in the past is involved in the ARDS pathway, and again, melatonin um, looks like it, it, again, not extensively studied, and this is all being looked at as we speak, but probably or potentially downregulates NFKB. Um, NFE2 related factor 2, uh, so the uh, uh, NFF2 uh, seems to have a potential protective effect, so unlike the NF kappa beta that causes ARDS. The NFE2 related factor um, seems to be protective, and it, it, at least in the basic science model, uh, melatonin will upregulate that, increasing it, which has a protective effect. Um, this seems to be protective not only to the lungs, but potentially to the liver and the cardiac as well. Couldn't find anything on kidney uh, in that regards. Um, so I think those are some in, important points. Uh, getting into the antioxidant effects, again, interleukin-6. Um, uh, uh, seems to um, be in the alveolar macrophages via another receptor, or a receptor called the toll-like receptor, the TLR4 um, slash NF kappa beta comes back into play, and it seems to be a therapeutic target in regards to the antioxidation uh, occurring in, in, in um, uh, that receptor. And then anti-inflammation, uh, there is information online about this as well, called the nod-like receptor, uh, NLRP3 inflammasome, and it seems like that the anti-inflammation is both an up and down regulation of this receptor, uh, as inflammasome, as they call it, and um, that, that's actually been looked at in a radiation therapy, uh, potentially some of the inflammation that occurs there, and melatonin being helpful in some uh, older studies uh, in regards to that. How much do you take? Are there risks to it? Um, you know, the general recommendation is that you only need about 0.3, so a third of a, uh, a, third of a milligram or so um, of melatonin for these effects to occur. Uh, some recommend starting at 0.2 to 0.5 milligrams of melatonin. I usually take it about two to four hours before bed. The bottles usually say take it about two hours or at bedtime. In my old sleep fellowship. Uh, New York, uh, we were taught, you know, probably take it uh, maybe uh, about four hours before bedtime before you hit that curve. Um, I did not have time to review all the studies with melatonin and, you know, what times of the days they were taking it for all these different studies. But in an eight-week study of six milligrams daily of melatonin, it did have an effect on reducing not only interleukin-6,
but tumor, uh, TNF alpha. So you can see uh, those two on the uh, chart, IL-6, TNF alpha um, uh, there. And um, additionally, uh, C-reactive protein CRP, uh, which we're sometimes checking when patients come in and it is elevated. Okay. So uh, decreasing the viral permeability uh, is in, in reducing the ARDS inflammation through those proteins and receptors, whether it be up or down regulating is, is where it's at. Um, additionally, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's hospitals around the country um, uh, that are reporting a concern for lack of sedative. Actually, you know, so many people going on ventilators, they require often one, two, three sedative drips and often paralytics and we're uh, flipping these patients prone to get them to oxygenate better. Uh, even uh, colleagues are reporting doing that um, uh, before they go on a respirator if their uh, CPR risk is low. Uh, but melatonin has a sedative effect. It's not going to be uh, like a narcotic drip that we give or a, a, a sedative drip that we give at least at that level, but certainly it's it's on the safer side and um, so it's it's something to consider that may give an additive benefit. Additionally, when patients are taking beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, there are studies that show, uh, so these are the uh, you know, low pressors, metoprolols, um, uh, and, and many different uh, calcium blockers, amlodipine or norvask, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, I'm not saying specifically those, but the classes of beta blockers and calcium blockers, uh, it, it has been studied, could reduce melatonin levels a little bit. And so if uh, patients are on those, uh, we don't think there's a, a risk for COVID, like we suggested, or that it's been suggested, I should say, with ACE inhibitors, although the societies are, are pretty much recommending to sit still at this point from what I could review, uh, it wouldn't be a bad thing necessarily if you are on medications that could suppress melatonin levels to potentially bring it up. Um, uh, I've read that, you know, in breastfeeding, uh, uh, there is transmission of melatonin uh, through the breast milk and um, uh, normally even, uh, you know, those levels are thought to have some sort of protective effect to the, ba to the baby, and this is mom's own natural melatonin. And some have even suggested that breastfeeding occur during uh, in dark rooms where they may actually put out more melatonin. It's a pretty quick response. When you go in the dark, melatonin levels, as I've mentioned on my earlier videos, go up. And when you're in bright light, uh, we have used bright light therapy for patients um, with sleep disorders, uh, exposing them in the, in the early morning hours and then very, very dark at night. And in Sleep Fellowship, I was taught to have patients sleep in a pitch black room, um, what, even night lights were bad, and to uh, if they were having problems with um, uh, you know, delayed sleep uh, phase where they're falling asleep later and waking up earlier, uh, that we would actually expose them to bright light in the early morning hours to push that curve back and then melatonin at night. So it's a two, two uh, uh, pin prong there on, on, on how to treat that. Um, uh, it seems that, you know, between 1 and 10 milligrams appears to be safe in humans. Uh, when you get up into that 30, 40 milligram dosing, uh, it could have some danger, and I'm not suggesting even going anywhere close to that. Personally, I'm buying the 5 milligrams and taking about a quarter of one right now, maybe a half, uh, and uh, you know, there's some getting used to effect, if you will. Um, uh, other than that, side effects have been reported. You know, if you have severe hypertension, uh, to be cautious. Um, it can cause sleepiness and drowsiness, headaches, a little bit of nausea and dizziness. I haven't experienced any of those myself. Again, with just a micro dose in 0.3 uh, will hopefully be enough uh, to get the ball rolling. But, you know, I'm suggesting somewhere in that 0.5 to 1, maybe even up to 3 to 5 max uh, for now. Again, cautious of severe hypertension. And I will disclaim if you have any questions, you know, or concerns about your health and, and your other comorbid conditions to please check with your clinician uh, first before taking any of these things. So uh, hopefully that 100,000 number will be uh, way off and we'll have way less deaths than that. I haven't checked uh, tonight or yesterday what China's total death rate was, and I, I forget their entire population size, but, um, you know, uh, we were a little bit late to the, late to the game, uh, but we had, you know, we, we had some obviously time to prepare for this and uh, hopefully it will pay off and it will be mitigated way less than 100,000 deaths. I, I would hope that that, um, that number is less than that, but I'm not here to philosophize. I'm here to provide hopefully unbiased um, information about these um, treatments and information about COVID-19. So everybody, please stay well and healthy and keep your immune systems in check. Get your sleep, uh, get your melatonin. 
uh, levels up naturally first, and uh, everybody have a great night. We'll see you later.